Galatians, the third chapter. I'll be reading out of the uh, New Revised Standard Version. If you have it, say, let's connect. If you have it, let's say, let's connect. I love the glow of the screen on your face as I know that you have your Bible in front of you and not social media. And the Bible reads, just as Abraham believed God and was reckoned to him as righteousness. So you see, those who believe are the descendants of Abraham. And the scripture for saying that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, declare the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the Gentiles shall be blessed in you for this reason. Those who believe are blessed with Abraham who believed. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not observe and obey all the things written in the book of law. Now it is evident that no one is justified before God by the law. For the one who is righteous will live by faith. But the law does not rest on faith. On the contrary, whoever does the works of the law will live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written... Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that Christ Jesus, the blessing of Abraham, might come to the Gentiles so that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Please bow with me in a word of prayer. Dear, kind, and merciful Father, Lord, we come to you this time and we say thank you. Lord, we thank you for putting air in our lungs, Lord, and allowing us to be in our right mind. Lord, we thank you for establishing your, your family here on this world known as the church. Lord, we, we understand the responsibility that we carry as your peculiar people in making you known to the world. Lord, let us never take light of the responsibility that we've been given. Let us never to treat it as though it's some type of special resort, but a, a mission that we've been given. Lord, we love the many ways that you are providing for us each and every day. Lord, we, words escape me in being able to express my gratitude in the way that you continue to love me despite me, the way you continue to love my children, the way you love our church, the way you love our children here at the church. Lord, we ask that you continue to keep your hand over this congregation as we move forward. Help us to be singularly focused on making you known in order that you might be glorified. We love you and we thank you. In Christ Jesus' name I pray. Let us all say amen. Amen. Kindly be seated at this time. When I was a kid growing up in Southern California, one of my favorite things to do was to visit the amusement parks. We had Disneyland and Magic Mountain, but as a teen, visiting the amusement parks was a special time. For it was an opportunity for me, for us, to floss. Now you may not be familiar what it means to to floss, but it was an opportunity to show your best gear. Now, the, the, the style at my time was, was, was baggy jeans and, 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 and coveralls and, 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 and a fresh pair of Nikes or feelers or Adidas in that order if, if you had them. But it was an opportunity to show off our wares. And the way that we wore our clothes was, was basically the way that we saw the people that we idolized, from the athletes to the, pu- to the public pers- personas that that filled our entertainment airwaves and radio waves, it was a chance to express ourselves. But I want you to know that even in wearing our clothes, sometimes it was backwards or inside out because inside out was wiggity, wiggity, wiggity whack. (laughs) In the cooler months, at times, we would even wear our starter cap with our starter jacket to set it off. Anybody else know what I'm talking about? Yeah, 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 yeah. That's, that's, that's what you had to wear in order to be flossing properly. And I recall that on one of the occasions I was at Disneyland and I was beholden by the beauty of America's top model. And as I sat, as I looked at this amazing woman, I noticed that she was sitting on the shoulders of John Singleton. And I looked and I said, you don't, you don't regularly see people like that. 
You know, supermodels hold up the standard of what beauty is believed to be. And because they're held up as the standard, designers use them to show off their creations, their vision of beauty and style. But just as Versace and Paul Lagerfeld and Tommy Hilfiger and Donna Karen have a vision for how their creation was worn, God has a vision for how his people are to wear their faith. Some of us use our faith as merely an outfit that we put on on Sunday morning. Some of us like to wear our faith too tight. Our embrace of legalism restricts and exposes our unflattering ways and beliefs. And when we're called to act on faith, we're exposed. Some of us like to wear our faith like baggy sweats or clothes in order as a mean to cover up our indulgences where we take advantage of God's grace and all it shows is that there's a lot to hide. Some wear their faith loosely in a revealing manner as though it makes them more relatable to the world. You see them commonly engage in things of the world just saying that I'm, I'm accessible. Of all the figures throughout the Jewish faith, none has been more central than Father Abraham. Presented as a supermodel of faith, Abraham's importance to Judaism is highlighted by the Apostle Paul as he points to him time and time again where he expounds on how, on how those are justified by faith. Paul refers to the faith of Abraham to the Roman churches in Romans 4 and 13 and here to the church in Galatia. Paul presents Abraham as a type. To describe how his audience should wear their faith and how they are counted at his children by doing things God's way. So Paul's argument to the churches of Galatia seeks to impress upon his audience the importance of the benefit of having the right relationship with God. He stressed it is only by faith or a belief in God that will endow them with righteousness or make them justified. Them being righteous makes them children of Abraham and permit them to receive the blessing by avoiding the curse of the law. In Paul's letter to the church of Galatia, we observe Paul making the argument that only those who live by faith can receive the blessing of Abraham. Paul makes an argument on two premises. First, that those who believe are of faith and are righteous. Second, those that live by the law are cursed. We see in the early part of the epistle that Paul chastises the people for misplacing their belief in a teaching that he did not give them. Paul continues questioning at the beginning of the chapter and into three, posing a rhetorical question asking, who has bewitched you or who has given you the evil eye? Being referenced to an, uh, an, an old ancient custom The the evil eye was when somebody placed a curse on you. And Paul was saying, who cursed you by giving you this belief? He begins sharing how Abraham was first credited with righteousness because of his faith and not by any other means. When God established his covenant with Abraham in Genesis 17 chapter around verse number 10, when he told him to be sacrificed, Abraham had already been credited with righteousness. It was not because of the circumcision. But it was because of his belief in God. To get an understanding or historical context of what's taking place, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm, I'm institutionalized. I, I have to go through the historical context, if you know what I mean. Paul's message and intent can be understood by the coloring lens in which the epistle was written. Although the authenticity of Galatians is not questioned, uh, some believe that the churches in the northern hemisphere, uh, this letter was addressed to them based off recent evidence, but I tend to believe that it was actually to the southern providences, those along his first trip, because he had visited with them before. The occasion of this Galatian epistle reveals Paul's authority. He establishes that in the very first chapter when he talks about his apostleship. But not only that, Paul's interest is made in this pointed letter of correction to turn them back from the false teachings by sarcastically questioning how they came to believe the Spirit. Paul appears to them out of his authority in chapter 2 and gives them an illustration using the the example of Abraham and the penalty of the law to convince his audience of their error. 
You see, the churches of Galatia were believed to be compromised by gentle, Gentile converts and Jewish believers who sought to impose a, Jew, a, a Jewish tradition upon the former. There were Jews that were coming in saying that in order to receive, to be counted righteous, you have to be circumcised. You must observe these Jewish customs. Paul makes it a point saying that when he had been converted, he went and visited with the disciples for 15 days and they, they added nothing to him. But not only that, that, that when he came back, he had Titus with him. And when he had visited with Titus, who was actually a Greek, on the second visit, they did not compel Titus to be circumcised, making his point that circumcision was not a requirement for righteousness. You see, the circumcision was a, an outward sign of the covenant established between Abraham and God in Genesis 17 and 10 and 11. And the Jews were fully aware of that. The Jews at that time took pride in saying that they were ch the children of Abraham. When they confronted Christ in John, the eighth chapter, around verse number 33, they said, we are the children of Abraham. But Jesus said, if you were the children of Abraham, why are you trying to kill me? So Paul makes this appeal using two diametrically opposed examples to make the point of how the Galatian members are justified in Christ. The first example Paul makes is make mentions that children of God are made by their faith. This means that this status is granted through adoption. The wonderful thing about adoption is that you are chosen. I did not choose Cameron and Haley. I would choose you again, though, I would, if I had a choice. But children that are adopted have been chosen. You see, you need to understand that the idea of adoption was favorable, was a favorable arrangement for the adoptee. In ancient times, those that were adopted had all the privileges but none of the responsibility. If the parents got old, it was not the responsibility of the adopted child. But they got all the blessing. The adopting parent pledged to care for the adoptee as if they were their own child. However, unlike blood children, they could not be sold into slavery. You see, slavery was a very real thing. People could sell their children into slavery to help pay a debt. They would sell themselves into slavery to pay debts. And so the idea that Paul uses turns this idea on his head by introducing the idea that anyone that prescribes the keeping the law are not heirs, but a slave. He makes this point in Romans, the fourth chapter, when he says, as long as they are minors, they are no better than slaves. They are the owners of the property, but they remain under the guardians and trustee until the date set by the father. You see, the familiarity of the audience with the idea of being a slave surely resonated. If I were to say sell out, or Uncle Tom, that would no doubt prick your ears in this audience. And Paul using the idea of a slave is no different than the words being used today. Slavery was a very common social status for those who were enemy captures or the spoils of war. One of five individuals were identified as a, as a slave in the, in the time of Roman, at the time of the Roman Empire. Slavery was also known as a temporary designation as outlined in Deuteronomy 15 because it says on every seventh year you were to free your slaves. So no doubt they were very familiar with the idea of what it meant to be a slave. But one thing to consider about his language is that the slave did not have any rights. Although slaves were allowed to worship and some may have even been taught uh, the Christian faith, they were allowed to be a part of the fellowship they understood that they had no rights. Now, due to the perversive nature of this, of this nature, the agitators who attempted to Judaize Paul's followers, it is believed that his, that his letter to the Galatians is expressly about the law. As when he addresses the church in Rome, when he addresses the church in Galatia, he is dealing with the law. The point of this letter was, was a pointed letter in that Paul did not give thanks for the church in Galatia. Part of his, his typical salute, uh, salutation was to give thanks for the saints who were at XYZ. 
If you notice in the the book of Galatians, Paul does not give thanks for them. Why? Because they had been bewitched. They had been bewildered. They had been given the evil eye, so to speak. One of the premises introduced to the, con- to the converts was the idea of the circumcision, the, the, which was the religious practice of the foreskin being removed. It was identified that on the eighth day of a child that this, this practice was to be made to the male child and to the slaves that were living in the household. It was a mark of righteousness according to the Abrahamic covenant. Now, part of the Jewish culture was also in the keeping of the holidays. You say, why are you bringing this up, Winrow? Because I want you to know that the Jewish, the Jewish people that were coming in, they were looking to pervert the gospel. They were setting hallmarks of what it meant to be righteous. What it meant to look righteous in the eyesight of God. And so a, a, a pious man, a righteous man, one, was circumcised. Two, he kept the, the religious laws. He kept the law or the Torah as it is referred by, by Hebrew brothers. All these practices were ultimately tied to the covenant, derived from the word Acadia, which means to bind. Whenever Paul uses covenant, covenant language or means the word covenant, now you start getting serious. The hearers of the word begin to understand that there is, there is a gravity to what is taking place. And to use such a word was to bring a sobriety to the topic that was at hand. For Paul to use such a word was parallel with contract speech. A covenant was an agreement made between two parties by the binding oath written by the parties. Now I want you to see this in Galatians 3, 6 and 8, where it says, Even as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him for righteousness, knowing therefore that they which are of faith are the same as the children of Abraham. Paul begins a deliberative oratory of offering scripture as an example of Abraham as a model of faith. This goes all the way back to Genesis 15 and 6, where it says that Abraham believed God and was credited with righteousness. Now his claim that the faith of the Gentile believer is synonymous to that of Abraham, therefore makes him his children. But Paul says that just as Abraham believed God and was credited with righteousness, Paul and his opponents agreed on Abraham as a faith model, but differed in the order in which it was received. You see, the word righteousness in the the original text was dekeo sini. Say that with me, dekeo sini. That means righteousness. Now, when we talk about righteousness, righteousness is basically Doing it God's way. Say it with me. Doing it God's way. It says that Abraham believed God. And what God did is that he, some people say some funny math. He credited him with righteousness. What did he do? He believed. What was given to him? Righteousness. So in order for one to be counted righteousness, one needed to believe in God. Paul uses the Old Testament scripture to make the point that one is justified by belief first before any sanctification process. If you notice when God established the covenant between him and Abraham, in addition to the circumcision, animals were sacrificed and the two parties would walk between the bloody parts. This was used to to confirm and to seal the covenant Paul continues to build his argument in verse number eight when he says, and the scripture, foreseeing that God would justify the heathen, the Gentile, through faith preached before the gospel unto Abraham, saying that in thee all nations shall be blessed. Paul is keenly aware of his audience and makes excellent use of the scripture to make his argument plain. His audience knew the scripture. They knew the text. And it is right here where we see the blessing of Abraham is exposed. Where he says, so then, they which be of faith are blessed with the faithful Abraham. For as many are the works of the law are under the curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Paul concludes his first argument in verse 9 by reaffirming that those who rely on faith are blessed with Abraham. Paul then moves to differentiate those who live by faith versus those who live by the law. The term law 
used with several contexts in his writing, generally referring to the first five books of the Old Testament. Paul begins a, a new argument in verse 10 by revealing that the paths of those unsubscribed to keeping the law. Paul writes that those that rely upon the law are cursed by the law. They become a slave to the law. We see that even in our own fellowship where we become slaves to the traditions that we've instituted in our own church. The preacher must wear a suit. The brother going to serve on a table. He got to have a jacket. But if we're going to embrace the law, then we have to embrace all the law. We can't have mixed fabrics in here. Some of us walking around with a mixed blend suit. Some of us are, 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 are eating foods that we, that we should not eat. You see how you get caught up in a dangerous web of, of trying to keep laws that weren't even intended for you? You see, when the law was written, it was written for the Jews. It was written as a way to identify and to make God's people peculiar. And it was written for those who were in exile. Those that had been come and brought up under the covenant under him in the Old Testament. To be under the curse relegates one to the obligation of doing all that the law requires. The writer shows that we can receive the blessing of Abraham through faith and thus avoid the curse of the law. And it is right here in verse number 11 where it states how to wear your faith. It says the righteous will live by faith. How are you wearing your faith? Is it too loose? Is it too tight? Is it barely hanging on? We see that the way that Abraham wore his faith, although Abraham was not a perfect man, Abraham did it God's way. By having faith in God, he was credited with righteousness. God is calling you today to do it his way. He's asking you to move from your center of comfort into a place that he will show you. Not a place that you already know, not a place that you've already been, but a place that he will show you. God is asking you to count only on him. You see, for Abraham to move from the land that he was familiar with was a trust of faith. You see, many of us, we get comfortable, especially for those at that time who were, who were farmers. They were, they were an agricultural people. They knew the land. They knew when it was going to yield its crop. They knew where they were going to get their water from. But for Abraham to leave his land was to leave his resources and to leave what he knew. And that's what God is calling us out to today, to leave those things that you knew into a place that he will show you. Abraham was called to make great sacrifices. He was called to sacrifice his promise, his hope, his son Isaac. And just like that, God is asking us to make a sacrifice of what we consider to be our hope. Are you going to trust in what you see? Or what God has promised you? You see, Paul, he shatters the metaphor by saying there is no rest for them who rest upon the law. You see, the thing about a person who's very legalistic in their faith is that they have boxes to check off to count themselves righteous. There are 52 weeks out of the year, and I was at all 52 Sundays. I give a tenth every single Sunday. As a matter of fact, I love my neighbor as I love myself. And therefore, to help prevent me from being in uncomfortable places, I don't interact with them too often. Because there's some ways I just can't love them. Yeah, I see their cars not working, but uh, I got to get to work. I don't see them. Yeah, I, I, I understand that, that, uh, that, 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 that they're, 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 they're struggling with some things in their lives, but I, I don't have the time to embrace, to, to help them along their way. We create, we become stranglehold into the traditions and the rules that we set for our place in order to make ourselves feel good. 
I have not forsaken the assembly. Therefore, me and God, we good. We good. I, I, I know I missed last week, but, but, but if I just give my money, then, then they, that's all they really care about. The rules that we make up in our minds to count ourselves righteous. I saw a brother outside, and so what I did, I, 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 I bought him a, a combo. You know, because I'm sending up my timber. You know, they say faith without works is dead. And so, you know, I'm working on my faith by, 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 by doing good things. I don't want him to ride in my car. I don't want to hug him, but I can throw a meal at him. It's easy to give of your, me- of your money and means as opposed to giving of yourself. Remember that. Paul continues his argument in the epistle where he invokes Leviticus Leviticus 18 and 5 just as he did with the churches in Rome where he says, the man that doeth them shall live by them. He shall live by them. And this is where we see where the curse is removed. You see in, in verse 13 it says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law by being made a curse for us for it is written, cursed is everyone that hangeth on a tree. That the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Paul begins verse 13 by stating that Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. The word in the Greek word for redeemed is exagrazio, which means he paid the price. When you've been redeemed, he paid the price to buy us out of slavery. There's some sins, there's some things that we we find ourselves beholden to. Things we don't want to let go for whatever reason and we don't realize by us not letting go of them, they have a hold on us. He paid the ransom. Redemption was an idea that was used primarily with a slave status. And for Paul to evoke that verbiage saying that he'd been redeemed means that you are all slaves. And you had been purchased with a price. You see, the sl- slavery was a practice that was very prevalent, to, so it implied that one being redeemed from the law also suggested that you were a slave to it. That you were a slave to it. I know many of us don't, don't actually consider the idea that some of the rules and traditions that we established in the church long ago, we're, we're beholden to that. Well, we only supposed to have one song leader. But meanwhile, we have so many capable brothers that are able to assist and so many capable sisters that are able to give her the gift. And what, it ha- what happens is shows that there's no place for them because of a bottleneck at the top. The church has been very guilty of, of creating bottlenecks in ministry where people feel that if they can't be the praise leader or they can't be the minister, then they can't serve. Because of the paradigm that we've created in our own tradition, of what, what it looks like to, be, to have an acceptable service, acceptable worship. We create these rules. Women need to wear, can't wear pants. Hair must be long. So what do you say to the woman that's battling cancer? You've painted, you've painted her into a corner saying that she's not giving respect to God because her hair is not long. Do you hear the stuff that, that, that we come up with? And we'll sit down a brother because he's not wearing his priestly collar. Can I take this off? I wear that sometimes for for y'all and other preachers because I know some folks might actually be offended. But these are traditions that we have placed on the church that God never intended. And what we do is that we, we, we put a choke on our faith and, and prevent it from growing because we're so caught up in our box. So caught up in our box of, of what it should be. And so what we'll do is that we'll, 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 we'll live in a gray area. We say we, 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 we won't embrace it, but we won't condemn it. But we don't embrace it, but it secretly is wrong. What kind of sense does that make? Now, some of these preachers over here know what I'm talking about. You know what I'm, what, I'm, what I'm tap dancing on. We won't condemn it publicly, but we don't embrace it. And we won't encourage anybody else to do it. 
That's us making laws where there were never any laws. Paul makes the reference when he says that the curse is hanged up on a tree, making reference to Deuteronomy 25 and 13. He says, the reference of the death... The reference of death penalty in Old Testament law, excuse me, Deuteronomy 21, 22, the uses of a tree refers to gallows. Now, if you understand anything about gallows, gallows, what, you know, anybody watch those old westerns? You know, they, 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 they had a hangman's tree. And what, they, and, and, what, and what hanging was designed to do was to cut off the person's airflow to the point that they could not breathe, to the point that it would break their neck and many of us have so many different rules and regulations that we put that we begin to we begin to suffocate ourselves suffocate ourselves to the point of spiritual death and Paul makes it quite evident he said they're hanging on trees he said for the wages of sin is death for believers, in order that we can obtain salvation, so we see Christ's death serve the purpose which results in Gentiles receiving the blessing of Abraham through faith. Abraham, he believed. Therefore, he was credited with righteousness. He was credited with doing it God's way. Paul's argument to live by faith of the law compels the Galatian churches to re-examine the, the new teaching that they had been given, that they had recently embraced and began to depart from. Paul makes mention several times in the patches that the righteous shall live by faith. And if you don't get anything else out of here from me other than a few good winks, understand that the righteous live by faith. I can't put any weight behind coming to church every Sunday in a three-piece suit. I can't put weight behind coming to, church, coming to church every Sunday and singing every verse of the song. That doesn't make me any more righteous than anyone else. I can't put any weight into attending every single Bible class, every single fellowship, when I know deep down in my heart I don't want to be there. We get so caught up sometimes with checking the boxes that we never check our heart. <sighs> Looking at the larger narrative of this letter, Paul meticulously explains in brilliant detail how there is freedom in Christ from made man rituals and false brethren. He uses the allegory of Hagar and Sarah Speaking how those who are of faith are the children of Sarah. But those who are the law are the children of Hagar. And because they are the children of Hagar, they cannot receive the inheritance that has been promised. He successfully argues that for those who rest on the law are cursed to hanging on that tree. The theme in this passage reveals that there is freedom by believing in Christ Jesus who paid the price by his blood and redeemed us from the penalty of the law just as God promised Abraham would be a blessing to nations including Paul's audience, the Gentiles. Where is the blessing of Abraham? Today we are not required to be circumcised physically but there is a spiritual circumcision of the heart that takes place when we are baptized and we are baptized because we believe. The very first thing a person asks you is, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the son of the living God? That then counts as righteousness. Going down into that water is the circumcision. But you've already been credited with righteousness based off your belief. And by following it and doing it God's way, he's counted as righteous. Now, we can make a direct correlation to the message of Galatians 3 today. In our very own lives today, today we, are not, we do not contend with people trying to Judaize the church. We contend with people trying to make the church an institution, a place of laws and regulations, who come in to spy out our, our, our freedoms in order that they can run away and tell, what, tell other folk what, what we're doing. 
In some fellowships, there's always a tendency to make rules where God never intended. The form of our traditions to require us to wear suits and ties to worship or even attend some, some grand crusades in some instances. There's always been a desire to judge a person's righteousness or ability to serve based off their attendance. People say, if I ain't seen you, your brother ain't faithful. Because they didn't scan their card here. They didn't dip their, 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 their cup with me just at this location. So there's a tendency to trust how well we keep or behave morally to measure our own righteousness. We must understand that we are saved by grace through faith and not of our own feeble works. Maybe you're here this morning. Anybody got a hand? Like, maybe you're here this morning and God has called you on a faith walk, but you refuse to move. How are you wearing your faith when you leave this fellowship? When God called Abraham, Abraham moved. That's why he's held up as the supermodel of faith. Yeah, he's, sure, he struggled. He lied. He said Sarah wasn't his wife when questioned about it. He faltered a couple of times. But the thing about Abraham that allows him to be held up as a model of faith is that he trusted God. He continued to grow even when his faith was weak. Many of us we feel that if we're if, if we not like Paul, writing out books, writing letters to other, other believers to, to help them on their faith walk, that we're terrible Christians. That's not so. Just as God used a lion man from the land of Ur, he can use you. He can use me. But some of you say, well, you, brother, I, I, I'm not struggling with that. I'm not struggling with that. I, I, I'm on my faith walk. As a matter of fact, I'm walking so well, I'm, I, I'm, I'm sea walking in the faith. But what about the sacrifices God has called you to make in your life? Somebody right here is struggling with making the sacrifices that God demands. There are things that you cling to secretly, privately, that you don't want anybody to know about because that is your refuge. And God is telling you, I need you to lay that out on the altar and, and, and give it to me. I need you to take that Isaac in your life, that thing that, that gives you hope at the end of the day, and give it to me and let me be your hope. But some of us, were too scared to do it. We're too scared to let go of that bottle. We're too scared to let go of those websites. We're too, too scared to let go of that guy or that girl that, 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 that gives us that emotional high that we know deep down just ain't no good for us or our faith walk. We don't want to give up that job that we know that, it, that, is, that is tearing us away from God. And God is saying, I've called you to sacrifice that. You see, for Abraham to, to, to sacrifice Isaac was a demonstration of faith in saying, Lord, I know that you gave me this promise and this promise is my hope, this is my future. And if I were to lose this, then I, then I would no longer have the, the, the hope and future that, that I, I can see happening. Because to see Isaac walking amongst him, he knows this, this kid is going to have kids, and their kid is going to have kids. And that's how, my, my, that's how my, my family will be like the stars. But for him to sacrifice Isaac meant that I'm putting all my hope in you. Is there anybody here today who has failed to sacrifice their Isaac? What are you holding on to? What is it that you're clinging to that, 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 that you believe br brings you hope? That gives you a temporary hope to deal with the day? Woo child! If you just knew what I dealt with, you, you wouldn't be asking me to give that up. I'm not asking you to give it up. God has called each and every one of us to give up an Isaac in our lives. The question is, would you do it today? On your feet, Mountain View. Let me give the illusion of wrapping it up.
on your feet. Maybe you're in your faith walk and you just feel like you're all alone. You feel beaten and battered because of the things that have been going on in your life and you feel like you just can't catch a break. I want you to know you're, you are not alone. You are not alone. A lot of times God does not look like how you want him to look in the midst of your troubles. If you recall the, the story in Luke 24 when it says that the two men were leaving the road of Emmaus and Jesus himself came near, but yet they did not recognize him. The same thing happens in our lives. We're walking, talking, we're discussing amongst ourselves, but we don't recognize Jesus in our life because the guy that walks up to us may not look like the strapping savior that we need him to be at the time of our midst. Or maybe we're like the children of Israel. In the midst of battle and we're wondering what we're going to do, we have nobody to defend us. And then we hear a voice whisper say, just, just be still. Just be still. And we're like, what do you mean, be still? If I be still, I, I, I can't be still. He said, the Lord will fight for you today. Exodus 14. Maybe you're here this morning, you just want prayer. This is the time. Come forward. If you want to pray, if you need prayer for strength, you need prayer for encouragement, you need prayer for a loved one that's not here, someone that's struggling with something, you can be the intermediary because you are the blessing of Abraham. Nations can't be blessed if they don't interact with you. And the longer that you keep yourself detached from other people, other nations can't be blessed. So I'm giving you an opportunity right now. Maybe you desire to be a part of the Lord's church. Well, what must you do? Well, you must believe. Believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God and be baptized, and then you will be added to the fellowship. Not voted in. Not interviewed. But added. Birthed into a family. Maybe you just want prayer for your family. This is the time. We're asking that we do this right now as we sing this song.